It's noon on the West Coast, 3 o'clock at Trump Tower in New York City, where a small meeting two years ago has become a very large controversy and leaves open the question, did members of Trump's family and campaign team violate a federal law? We'll look at what we know in the wake of President Trump's latest tweet. A big day in the trial of the president's former campaign chairman, Paul Manafort's right-hand man taking the stand. What secrets could he spill? Plus, Europe hits back after Washington slaps new penalties on Iran. Plus, why Facebook reportedly wants to know how much money you have in the bank. And the bank error that was not in their favor, why a glitch cost hundreds of people their homes. Also, the U.S. military helping to put out some fires. And Amish? Uber? It's real. Let's get to it. Now, Shepard Smith reporting, live from the Fox News deck. Did members of the Trump campaign commit a crime? First from the Fox News deck this Monday afternoon, the White House is shifting narratives on his Trump Tower meeting. President Trump admitting again, this time on Twitter, the infamous now sit-down with a Russian with ties to the Kremlin at Trump Tower was set up so that the campaign could get dirt on Hillary Clinton. Analysts say that could be a crime. Under federal law, 52 U.S.C. 30121, it is unlawful for a foreign national to contribute anything of value to an election campaign. And under that same code, conspiring with someone to solicit such a contribution is also unlawful. Whether the meeting constituted a crime has not yet been resolved. Remember who was there. Donald Trump Jr., the first son-in-law, Jared Kushner, the campaign chairman, Paul Manafort, and five others, including the Russian lawyer with Kremlin ties, Natalia Veselnitskaya. According to the president's admission, it's not the first time we've heard something like that from him. But this appears to be his most direct public acknowledgement that this was not a meeting primarily about Russian adoptions, as we first heard. Instead, it was a political opposition research meeting between members of the Trump team and his family with a woman connected to the Kremlin. We're going to show you how it all unfolded, where it leaves us, and how important it actually is. Here's how this chapter began. Over the weekend, the Washington Post reported the president is concerned about the involvement of his son, Donald Trump Jr., in special counsel Robert Mueller's Russia investigation. The president then tweeted, fake news reporting, a complete fabrication that I am concerned about the meeting my wonderful son Donald had in Trump Tower. This was a meeting to get information on an opponent, totally legal and done all the time in politics. And it went nowhere. I did not know about it. The president said something similar more than a year ago. I think from a practical standpoint, uh, most people would have taken that meeting. It's called opposition research or even research into your opponent. It is important to remember what the White House said initially. Repeatedly, it asserted that the meeting was not about a campaign issue, but adoptions. That was according to a statement from Donald Trump Jr. White House Press Secretary Sarah Sanders said in August of last year that the president did not write that statement. He certainly didn't dictate, but, you know, he, like I said, he weighed in, offered suggestion like any father would do. Eleven months later, we learned exactly the opposite. President Trump's legal team wrote in a memo to the special counsel, Robert Mueller, and I quote, You have received all the notes, communications, and testimony indicating that the president dictated a short but accurate response to the New York Times article on behalf of his son, Donald Trump Jr. He dictated it. Sanders did not answer questions about how that contradicted her original statement, which it did. Instead, she referred reporters to outside counsel. President Trump's admission on Twitter comes as his legal team and special counsel Robert Mueller negotiate the terms of a possible sit-down between Mueller and President Trump. Our chief White House correspondent, John Roberts, is live this afternoon on the North Lawn. Hi, John. 
Shep, good afternoon to you. you. know, the president and White House staff keep saying that they'd like this Mueller investigation to wrap up as quickly as possible, but the president seems to be compelled to send out tweets that keep this whole thing very much alive. We first learned about this in July 8th of last year when the New York Times ran an article detailing that in June of 2016, Donald Trump Jr. had met with the people that you talked about. The very first statement that we got on that, July the 8th, said, quote, it was a short introductory meeting. I asked Jared and Paul to stop by. We primarily discussed a program about the adoption of Russian children that was active and popular with American families. Then, as the timeline moves along, the next day the explanation shifted a bit. After pleasantries were exchanged, the woman stated that she had information that individuals connected to Russia were funding the Democratic National Committee and supporting Ms. Clinton. Her statements were vague, ambiguous, and made no sense. Then two days later, another evolution. The information they suggested they had about Hillary Clinton, I thought, was political opposition research. As you pointed out in that press conference with Emmanuel Macron in early July, the president acknowledged that the meeting was about opposition research and that a few days later tweeted, quote, most politicians would have gone to a meeting like the one Don Jr. attended in order to get information on an opponent. That's politics. You followed along, Shep, the timeline of what we learned about what Donald Trump, the president, uh, might have had in terms of his involvement in that. We were told that he did not dictate uh, that uh, memo. Then uh, we were told that he weighed in. And then finally, Rudy Giuliani said that he did dictate the whole thing. Uh, while the president appeared to acknowledge a year ago that, in fact, this was a meeting about political opposition research, Democrats found new reason to weigh in and say that the president has been incomplete in his explanations at the at the best and downright uh, untrue about all of this at the worst uh, adam schiff the ranking member on the house intelligence committee tweeting today quote the russians offered damaging info on your opponent your campaign accepted and the Russians delivered. You then misled the country about the purpose of the Trump Tower meeting when it became public. Now you say you didn't know in advance. None of this is normal or credible. There have been reports that Michael Cohen, the president's former attorney, uh, was going to say that the president knew in advance about this meeting. The president has said he did not know about it. And in emails that were released by Donald Trump Jr. and in his congressional testimony, there doesn't appear to be any suggestion that the president knew about the meeting in advance. The other big question that you brought up, will the president sit for an interview with Robert Mueller? Last week, Mueller declined the president's attorney's proposal to ask only questions about Russia, the election, and collusion, saying he also wants to ask questions that go to the issue of obstruction of justice. One of his attorneys, Jay Sekulow, said yesterday they are still weighing whether or not this will happen. Listen here. We are moving as expeditiously as possible to make the determination and make our recommendation to the president. The president has been clear that he wants to interview. I will tell you, his legal team is concerned. We're concerned on a number of reasons. The president's legal team has told me that they may respond as early as late today to Robert Mueller. It may not be until tomorrow, maybe sometime after that. Jeff? John Roberts, thank you. Right now, breaking, we're waiting for the star witness to take the stand in Paul Manafort's trial. Prosecutors say they're planning to call Rick Gates. He's up next. He's the former Trump campaign chairman's right-hand man, his one-time business partner, who also worked on the Trump campaign. Fox News spotted Rick Gates at the courthouse a short time ago. If anybody knows Manafort's secrets, the analysts say, it's Rick Gates. Gates admitted lying to the FBI and then cut a deal to cooperate in special counsel Robert Mueller's Russia investigation. Manafort has pleaded not guilty to all charges against him. Our Peter Ducey is live at the courthouse, Alexandria, Virginia, just outside the district. Peter? Shep, a clean-shaven Rick Gates is here. He is the witness that just last week the judge, T.S. Ellis, said the Mueller team needs if they are going to prove a conspiracy charge against Paul Manafort. Now, Rick Gates is also seen as critical because they do believe that he has the most intimate knowledge of his former business partner Paul Manafort's alleged financial crimes. The witness prior to Gates, who's on the stand right now, former Manafort accountant Cindy Laporta, testified just now that Gates was actually the one sending her some fraudulently document, uh, fraudulently drafted financial forms that would eventually serve the purpose of lowering Paul Manafort's tax bill. She also testified that some of the documents Gates was sending her on Manafort's behalf were basically laughably 
fake, but she filed or submitted them anyway, including a tax return she said was so wrong she was disturbed by it. Laporta was given immunity to testify. Gates has not been, but he did decide to cooperate after he pled guilty to lying to the FBI. Chef. Are there more witnesses after Gates, or is this thing soon to wrap up on the prosecution side? We know the prosecution wants to wrap up at some point this week. We do not know if there's anybody after Gates, but this is essentially now the third major act of the Manafort trial. Act one would be last Tuesday when the Mueller team gets up and they start alleging that Paul Manafort lived a very lavish lifestyle with $15,000 ostrich coats and flower beds shaped like an M for Manafort, but while he was spending money on flashy things like that, they alleged he hid money from the IRS. Act two was when the Mueller team brought a bookkeeper and two accountants to the stand to explain how and why Manafort was able to get away with this. Act three, the inside man, Rick Gates, he's next. Shep. Peter Ducey live at the courthouse. We'll go back there for updates, should there be any. In the meantime, A.B. Stoddard is here, associate editor and columnist at Real Clear Politics. Good to see you. Good to see you, Shep. Rick Gates, what might he provide? Well, it, this is going to be dramatic no matter what because you have former friends and colleagues turning on each other. Uh, this idea that Ducey has reported on that the Manafort team is alleging R Rick Gates embezzled money uh, and hid that from from uh, Paul Manafort and was on the take and, as they say, had the hands in the cookie jar. If, they, if the defense produces documentation of that and verification of that, that could muddy the waters in terms of the value of Rick Gates as a prosecuting witness. But from the testimony of the accountant, the fact that Paul Manafort knew about every detail was very fastidious, meticulous about having to control the information flow and how to hand and everything. It's really um, going to be surprising if uh, Rick Gates was able, if the, if the Manafort defense team can show that Rick Gates pulled the wool completely over Paul Manafort's eyes. Also, at the time that Rick Gates began to cooperate with the special counsel's team, a Manafort statement read something like, I hope that my f you know, friend Rick Gates will prove strong enough to, to help defend us and prove us innocent. So at that time, months ago, he was certainly not accusing Rick Gates of being the fall guy. So this is going to be an interesting um, and very dramatic testimony to see what the defense team does to Rick Gates as, um, as a witness. Not so much that we know what the prosecution is going to argue, but how far Manafort's team could go in undercutting Gates. Gates' credibility is really what's going to have the ultimately, the, obviously the ultimate effect on Manafort's, um, the outcome of this trial for him. If, if there is a conviction, is, is that the goal or is it seen in Washington as the goal being get a conviction against Paul Manafort so that then Paul Manafort would have incentive to give up information on the president in the Mueller investigation? All along, Shep, everyone has believed that Mueller would succeed, the special counsel would ultimately succeed in flipping Paul Manafort, and he has not done it. It would be very stunning at this point, the experts say, for him to get into trial and get into sen sentencing and then uh, try to strike a deal. His best leverage was before this, but he, in he intended to go, he went ahead with the trial, and his leverage gets reduced over time once you're in trial, and obviously depending on the outcome of the trial. So it has always been a big surprise to people that Paul Manafort was willing to send himself to jail for many, many decades. That is over 70 years of age. Um, they don't know if that means he believes President Trump will pardon him or what his long game is, but he has certainly resisted to much um, stun, um, stunned surprise of the experts any uh, overtures from special counsel to provide any help on, on uh, the rest of the case. A.B. Stoddard, thank you. Thanks, Jeff. So, how much money do you have right now in your bank account? Asking for a friend. A friend named Facebook. Because Facebook, Facebook wants to know how much money you have in your bank account. So it's asking the bank. Ahead why the company is reportedly requesting that, requesting that banks hook, hook it up with users' financial data. That's coming up from the Fox News deck on this Monday afternoon. The folks at Facebook know where you live, what you look like, and how to contact you. And now they apparently want some of your financial information as well. According to the reporting of our corporate cousins at the Wall Street Journal, Facebook is asking banks for data including credit card transactions and checking account balances. A Facebook spokeswoman told the journal the company would use the banking information to offer new services to users. 
not to target them with ads. Fox News and Facebook have a partnership to deliver news on Facebook Watch. Fox News is solely responsible for its content and production. The Fox Business Network's Deirdre Bolton is here. So they want our, our, our data about our money. Okay, so the Facebook actually says that the Wall Street Journal reporting overreached, but I do want to give you the list of the banks. So it's J.P. Morgan, Citi, Wells Fargo, and U.S. Bancorp. So according to our colleagues at the Wall Street Journal, they say that Facebook asked for detailed information from those four banks, but then Facebook put out a statement saying it disagrees with the reporting. I'm just going to pull up part of it. They put out a pretty long statement. I picked two quotes. Recent Wall Street journal story implies incorrectly that we are actively asking financial services companies for financial transaction data. This is not true. Second part of that statement, idea that messaging with a bank can be better than waiting on hold over the phone. It's a completely opt-in. We're not using this information beyond enabling these types of experiences, not for ads or anything else. So analysts are saying, listen, the long game for Facebook here is that if you use Facebook Messenger, uh, almost like we might exchange money for a good or a service in our normal bank, that uh, essentially Facebook wants to do the same thing. The problem for Facebook, obviously, is that they have two huge PR black eyes recently. Of course, Cambridge Analytica, we know 87 million Facebook users had their information taken, essentially without consent. And then we know in the run-up to our presidential election, 125 million Facebook users, so half of our voting population, saw an ad that was either manipulated or created by a Russian bot. So there's a lot of banks and other institutions that are saying, mm, okay, we maybe don't want to be associated uh, with Facebook at this time. Our colleagues at the Journal said actually one big bank that they chose to name. did not name. Uh, has actually pulled back for this. To me, though, the big sort of sum up is that uh, essentially technology is coming for banking. So the banks need to be a little bit more on their toes. Um, we have Amazon looking to do the same thing. Google as well. Alphabet's Google doing the same thing as well. So that when you say, hey, Alexa, I'd like to buy more <laughs> snacks from my pop, um, your banking data is already there. Deidre, thank you or something. Yeah, very welcome. <laughs> Word of a new clue in the search for the missing college student, Molly Tibbetts. Well, shall I tell you what a witness reported seeing in the area on the night Molly Tibbetts disappeared? Plus, yet another kid's lemonade stand running into trouble. Not permits this time. No, this time because of a robber packing a gun. That's next. We're coming up. <laughs> a neighbor tells Fox News she saw a suspicious black SUV circling her small town in Iowa the same night a college student vanished. Molly Tibbetts has been missing for about more than two weeks now, and the reward for her safe return has jumped to $260,000. She was last seen jogging in Brooklyn, Iowa, just east of Des Moines, where she was dog-sitting for her boyfriend, we're told. The neighbor who says she saw that SUV lives a block away from the boyfriend's house. Our Matt Finn is live in Brooklyn, Iowa. Matt? Shep, that neighbor tells us that she reported that suspicious SUV to the FBI when she was questioned. How the FBI is using that piece of information is just not clear. This afternoon, we sat down with Molly Tibbetts' father. Again, he tells us that he believes that his daughter is alive somewhere, being held against her will, and he is urging anyone with any information to come forward. He says he believes that Molly Tibbetts might have got into a car willingly and that the person she got into the car with perhaps misinterpreted the nature of their relationship and then made a horrible mistake. Here is Molly Tibbetts' father. The longer we go without finding Molly, um, the longer we go without finding Molly's body, the more hopeful we are that she's alive somewhere um, and going through something that she can survive. Molly's dad also tells us that Molly was constantly using her iPhone and her Fitbit, which is an uh, electronic health tracking device. Police can extract a ton of information from the iPhone and the Fitbit, perhaps her exact steps that day. We reached out to Fitbit to see if they have turned over any information to authorities. They say they don't want to comment on that. We also reached out to Apple, but so far they have not returned our requests for information. Shep. Hey, Matt, the, the reward now at $260,000, how did it go up so extraordinarily? 
The family partnered with Crime Stoppers of Central Iowa, Shep, which substantially increased this reward. Just a few days ago, it was hovering around $2,000. Now it's inching closer to $300,000. The family says they want to use this money to basically pay off anyone that might have her. They are also continuing to urge people to use that 1-800 tip line, which is 1-800-452-1111. And you can also visit CrimeStoppersOfCentralIowa.com. Shep. Matt Finn on scene. A plane that crashed in Southern California over the weekend just seemed to fall out of the sky. That's how one witness described what happened as the Cessna took a nosedive into a parking lot, killing all five people on board. This is dash cam video. Keep an eye on the right-hand side of the screen there. Here it is again. You'll see the plane go straight down. It smashed into a car in a parking lot in Santa Ana. Thankfully, nobody was in that car. Trace Gallagher in our West Coast News Hub. What, what word do we have on what might have caused that crash? Well, as you said, Shep, we know planes don't just fall out of the sky, yet this one appeared to, and that's baffling aviation experts. The Cessna 414 is an eight-passenger high-performance aircraft. It's pressurized, can fly to 30,000 feet at 270 miles per hour. Seconds before the crash, the pilot did radio that he had an emergency, but did not state the emergency. So engine failure is a possibility, but it's a twin-engine plane, and the odds of both failing at the same time are extraordinarily low. This plane has a range of 1,500 miles. The trip from Concord, just east of San Francisco to Orange County, is about 400 miles. So the plane should have had fuel, but witnesses say when the plane was turning, the engines were silent. And aviation expert Mike Boyd just told us the fact that there was no explosion might be very telling. Watch. First thing they're going to be looking at is fuel. Was there fuel in the tanks of that airplane? I would say with a crash like that and no fire, it was probably a dry airplane. Yeah, the plane crashed one mile from John Wayne Airport where it was scheduled to land in Orange County. Shut. What do we know about the victims, Trace? Well, the pilot has been identified as Scott Shepard, the owner of a real estate consulting firm in the San Francisco Bay Area. Shepard was also a very experienced pilot and recently had his pilot's license renewed. In fact, some have noted the plane crashed very near South Coast Plaza, one of the busiest shopping centers in the country. And there was speculation early on that because no one on the ground was hurt, that he may have steered the plane away from the mall. But it now appears that in the final seconds, he had very little control of that airplane. Laura Shepard, reportedly the pilot's wife, was also on board. The other victims have been identified as Navid Hakimi and his wife, Floria, who posted about the flight just moments before it took off on Instagram. The fifth victim is Nassim Ganadan. All of those killed worked at the very same Northern California real estate consulting firm. NTSB is on scene. Shep. Trace Gallagher reporting from Los Angeles. Wildfire alert. The military is now planning to send about 200 active duty soldiers to help put out the fires in California. Two defense officials tell Fox News the soldiers have special training in engineering. The fires have killed at least nine people. One fire in Mendocino, which is north and west of Sacramento, has been extremely difficult for crews to contain. Officials say it's now the second largest wildfire in California history. They say it's spread across lakes and major roads. It's been growing stronger even at night when most fires on the West Coast tend to calm down. Police in North Carolina are looking for a teenager they say robbed a nine-year-old's lemonade stand at gunpoint. This happened in Monroe, about 30 miles south and east of Charlotte. The teen made off with about $17. The kid he robbed is fine, but investigators there are calling it a new low. You know, I think people you know, are capable of a lot of things, but not robbing a child of a lemonade stand. That one takes it to a new level. Investigators say they're looking at a, or looking at a camouflage hat, a metal tin, and a black BB gun they found in a wooded area not far from that lemonade stand. The kid's dad says the boy was selling lemonade again the day after the robbery. He's saving up for a new lawnmower. About time for a GoFundMe, if you ask me. There are some things for which you can say sorry, and perhaps all is forgiven. For instance, spilling wine on the couch or bumping into somebody on the street. Know when an apology might not cut it. When your mistake costs hundreds of people their homes. Today, the bank that admits it blew it coming up. Plus, a fireball erupts on the road and dozens are hurt. The details as we approach the bottom of the hour and the top of the news coming right up. I'm 
Leah Gabriel with the Fox Report and more of today's headlines. An explosion on a highway in Italy killing at least two people and hurting up to 70 others. That's the word from police near the northern city of Bologna. Italian media reports the blast involved a truck carrying flammable cargo. Meantime, a SWAT officer shot in the face during a firefight in Philadelphia. Investigators say the SWAT team entered the home to serve a warrant when a man started shooting. The suspected gunman and a 60-year-old woman who was inside also critically wounded. The police commissioner says the officer was able to walk himself into the hospital and is expected to survive. And a dramatic rescue in Atlanta caught on body camera. Police saving a person from a burning car. Investigators say the vehicle smashed into a utility pole and then caught fire, and the front seat passenger was trapped inside. The officers pulled the person out through the driver's side door. The news continues with Shepard Smith right after this. Take that, Iran. President Trump hitting Iran with the first financial punishment since he pulled the United States out of the nuclear deal back in May. There was a 90-day waiting period before the sanctions could restart. The White House also warning now of severe consequences for anybody, any nation, that keeps doing business with Iran, which could include U.S. allies. And now, some of those allies are fighting back. Rich Edson on the top story at the bottom of the hour, live from the State Department. Hey, Rich. Uh, hey, Shep. They are fighting back. They say they're going to continue conducting business with Iran. This is Britain, Germany, and France. They were part of the Iran nuclear deal. They say they're going to stay in it, and they're going to continue adhering to it. They just put out a statement on this saying, quote, We are determined to protect European economic operators engaged in legitimate business with Iran, the preservation and maintenance of effective financial channels with Iran, and the continuation of Iran's export of oil and gas. Senior administration officials say they plan to fully enforce U.S. sanctions, so they could be at loggerheads on this one here. The United States at midnight will reimpose sanctions on Iran's conduct and trade uh, when it comes to U.S. dollars, Iran's currency abroad, precious metals, its auto sector. And then in about three months, the U.S. is going to reimpose sanctions on oil and gas for Iran, and on top of that, its banking sector, Shep. Same time, President Trump has offered to meet with the Iranian leader, and now a bit of a pushback on that. Yeah, that's right. Hassan Rouhani, the president of Iran, is saying no thank you. And he also says that the president is essentially, in his offer, just trying to make a made-for-television moment with Iran, only to divide the Iranian people. So Iran's rejecting that idea right now. Meanwhile, the administration says Iran is on shaky ground. There are protests ongoing in that country. They have continued for some time now about the economic conditions, uh, whether it's the inflation there or what folks are, are, are protesting there, uh, what they say is the corruption of the regime there. The Trump administration says the Iran's government took a windfall from the Iran nuclear agreement. They're trying to reverse that. In the end, the administration says it is not trying to change the regime in Iran, only its behavior, and it believes that reimposing the sanctions will do so. Jeff? Rich Edson at the State Department. Chinese state media slamming President Trump today, and the attack, pretty personal. The People's Daily newspaper accusing the pre President Trump of of starring in his own carefully orchestrated street fighter style deceitful drama it went on to say it is wishful thinking for president trump to hope others would play along with his drama the trade war between washington and beijing has been escalating with each imposing billions of dollars in tariffs on the other's products over the weekend president trump tweeted that china is for the first time doing poorly against us Meantime, North Korea is calling for the United States to drop restrictions on that country's trade, even though there are signs that the regime in, in uh, North Korea is building new missiles and expanding its nuclear weapons program instead of scaling back. Our senior foreign affairs correspondent, Greg Palcott, is live with this. Greg? Hi, Chef. Yeah, we're listening to some more tough talk today from North Korea and some bad actions from North Korea according to the United Nations. Now, just two days after Secretary of State Pompeo met with his North Korean counterpart at a security forum in Singapore, Pyongyang demanded that the U.S. drop sanctions against the country, calling it, and this is a quote, outrageous that they have to denuclearize before getting rid of those bans. 
Now, this comes as the U.N. accuses, in, in a report that was just issued over the weekend, North Korea of working with Russia and China to get around those sanctions. Let's confirm what we've been reporting for the past couple of weeks now, that they are building missiles and fissile material for nuclear weapons in defiance of the U.N. sanctions. For its part, the North points to various actions to show that it's acting in very good faith, including the return back to the States last week of what's believed to be the remains of those U.S. service members missing from the Korean War. The line from the Trump administration over the weekend and today continues to be that Chairman Kim has got to deliver on everything that he promised at that summit in June in Singapore. We are not starry-eyed, National Security Advisor Bolton told Fox News. We are going to have to see performance. He also, by the way, Shep, downplayed some reports we've been seeing today that there might be another Trump-Kim summit in the offing in the next couple of months. Back to you. Greg Palcott, live for us, thanks. Hundreds of Americans lost their homes to foreclosure because a bank made a mistake. And that bank was Wells Fargo, which has spent the past year and a half in and out of hot water. Since 2016, Wells Fargo execs have admitted that they created fake accounts in customers' names, hitting them with unfair mortgage fees, and charging them for car insurance that they didn't even need or ask for. But folks, don't worry. Those with Wells Fargo say they're working to help those who are affected and also that they are very sorry. The Fox Business Network, Susan Lee, is here. Lots of sorries. Lots of sorries. I would call it an erosion of trust, mm -hmm. especially for the country's third largest bank. In fact, they have yeah the third largest amount of assets under management, and they're the largest credit card issuer in the country. So the, there's a lot to say sorry for. In this latest case, it was 625 homeowners. 400 of them ended with foreclosures, and they were actually eligible for some relief in their loans. Unfortunately, due to a miscalculation, according to Fel Wells Fargo, these 400 lost their homes. Uh, we just got a statement from Wells Fargo earlier on about the very sorry uh, and what, what happened there in those loans. They say we're very sorry that this error occurred and are providing remediation to the approximately 625 customers that were impacted here. The remediation is, but they said it set aside $8 million. If you calculated that out to 625 homeowners, that's around $12,800. That's not enough for a new home no. for those that have you know, unfortunately lost their houses, right? Right? Not and this, at all. Not at all. And it just adds to the you know long list, a laundry list of events that have happened over the last 18 months. Two million fake accounts that were established to basically boost up commissions for a lot of their upsellers. And then you had the chairman and CEO eventually having to step down. So we had management change at Wells Fargo. And then what about the auto loans fines when they were selling unnecessary insurance policies? And also they were sneaking in some of these mortgage, uh, some of these mortgage fees actually in that one billion dollar fine as well and then this, this is the latest so you know the federal reserve said enough is enough in february of this year they did something unprecedented in the banking world they told wells fargo you can't grow your balance sheet anymore mm. we'll see what happens next yeah <laughs> should be interesting yeah susan thank you thank you susan lee from the biz there's word attackers tried to use a drone to assassinate the leader of venezuela again there's word that that happened now we're waiting to hear about arrests but first protest over Florida's controversial stand-your-ground law. The law used to defend, among others, the gunman in the death of Trayvon Martin. The new, the new case now that's sparking demonstrations. That's next. Politicians and activists in Central Florida are pushing back on the state's controversial stand-your-ground law. That law can essentially get somebody off the hook for a killing as long as a court decides that the person was asked, acting in self-defense to save his or her life. That's the argument that the defense is taking after somebody shot and killed this man, Marquise McLaughlin, outside a convenience store in Clearwater, which is between Tampa Bay and the Gulf Coast. It's the same tactic that the defense used to clear George Zimmerman in the Trayvon Martin shooting more than five years ago. Phil Keating is live in our Florida newsroom. Phil? Jeff Trayvon Martin's parents even showed up yesterday offering their support for an arrest and a murder charge, which so far has not happened. Also on the hand yesterday, all five Democratic candidates for governor, Reverend Al Sharpton, and 500 people, all calling for the shooter of Marquise McLaughlin to be arrested, which, as you said, the sheriff refuses to do, citing the law. 
This time, the whole thing's on video. McLaughlin and his girlfriend went to the store. She parked illegally in a handicapped spot. He went inside. And that's when 47-year-old Michael Dretschka approached her, started arguing about her not having a handicapped placard. Well, that's when the unarmed McLaughlin comes out of the store, pushes Dretschka to the ground, who then, on the asphalt, pulls out his legally concealed handgun and shoots. Just like Florida's 2012 shooting death of Trayvon Martin by neighborhood watchman George Zimmerman, Dredge claims the same defense, the state's controversial stand-your-ground law, saying he felt like his life was threatened. The jury in that high-profile trial acquitted Zimmerman of her. In this case, the Black McLaughlin family says the video is on their side, and you can judge as well. Now, pay close attention to McLaughlin's body motion in the final moment of the altercation, after the shove and then the shot. Here's McLaughlin's father. As you can see, when he pulled that gun out, uh, Marquis was taking a couple steps back. Mr. Draco had full control of the situation right then and there. He had four seconds to think about it. He did not have to pull that trigger. Now, the Florida NRA actually disagrees with the Pinellas County Sheriff in his interpretation of the Stand Your Ground law. The NRA says, no, a sheriff or police chief could still make an arrest if there's probable cause. As it is right now, this case remains with the state attorney's office. It's under investigation, and the state attorney still has yet to decide whether he will or won't file any charges. Chip. Phil Keating in South Florida. Government officials in Venezuela say six suspects are under arrest after a failed attempt to assassinate the president, Nicolas Maduro. They're, they're, they are accusing the suspects, who, who they call terrorists and assassins, of flying drones packed with explosives toward an event on Saturday. Here's the video. You can see security quickly surrounding the Venezuelan president who wasn't hurt. That's body armor of sorts. According to the government, seven soldiers did get injured in the apparent attack. Nicolas Maduro is blaming his political opponents. But opposition leaders say it's irresponsible to point the finger at them with no proof. Venezuela's government often accuses the opposition of plotting to overthrow the president. Steve Harrigan with more on this. Steve? Shepard, the government said this was a drone attempted assassination. There were two drones on the scene, each ordinary that anyone could buy for about $5,000. They stay in the air about 30 minutes. They can be controlled from about one mile away. The difference with these two drones, which were right near the podium where you had the president, the Supreme Court, and top generals, is that they were carrying about two pounds of plastic explosives each. One of them blew up and went into an apartment building, setting off a fire there. The second one, Venezuelan officials say, was blocked electronically by Venezuelan security officials. Now, six people so far have been arrested. Also, a shadowy group inside Venezuela has claimed responsibility, also saying they're going to try again to kill Maduro. But Maduro himself says the masterminds of this attack are from neighboring Colombia and the United States. U.S. officials say they have nothing to do with this attack. The Maduro regime has any hard evidence uh, of people in the United States engaging in activity that rises to a criminal violation, send it to us and we'll take a serious look at it. They haven't done that yet. This entire televised event was to supposed to show that Nicolas Maduro is in complete control inside Venezuela. Instead, it was the reverse. He had soldiers running for their lives in a real sense of confusion there. It comes at a time of weakness for the president. Right now, there is one million percent inflation inside Venezuela. The government originally thought about lopping three zeros off the currency. Now they have decided to chop off five zeros from their currency. Shepard. Wow, Steve Harrigan live on that story. In a lot of places, you can open an app on your phone and order an Uber to drive you wherever you want to go. But in Amish country, think about it. That's next. Even people who don't have our modern technology can become sort of Uber drivers. Meet the Amish guy in southern Michigan who's dubbed himself, dubbed himself the Amish Uber. He drives folks around for five bucks a pop in his horse and buggy. Doesn't have a cell phone, obviously, so you need to flag him down. And he isn't officially associated with Uber, but he gets people where they're going for an Abe Lincoln note, which is a pretty good deal anywhere. A koala caught in the headlights happened down under in Queensland in Australia. Thankfully, a cop spotted the little fuzzy guy sitting in the middle of the road. 
He flipped on his emergency lights, but the koala didn't budge. So here we go. The officer got out and convinced koala, it's better for you to go this way. And on this day in 1991, the World Wide Web went live to the public for the first time. In 91, a British scientist created the first website. It was a way for universities and researchers to share information all around the world. You can still see a version of that site online. It includes information about what the World Wide Web is, instructions on how to use it, and links to other pages. A far cry from the social, social media shopping and animal videos we now are so privileged to see after the interwebs were available to all 27 years ago today, 1991. No internet. Remember libraries? Only barely. Check out the Dow. The final bell will ring in just about four hours and 40 minutes. I should four minutes. I should say three minutes and 40 seconds. Dear journalists, don't do math. Not live on TV. Never looks good. Up 31 on the session. Clearly we were down at the end of the session. Why did it go up, John Glenn? Uh, tech, tech, he thinks. He sent out an email. Berkshire but Hathaway. Berkshire Hathaway, something this, that. Cavuto knows these things. <laughs> right after this newscast, you can catch us on Facebook Watch for a Fox News update there. It'll stream live on Facebook Watch, home screen, in just a few minutes. And we'll remind you of a time about a year ago. We knew then about the Trump Tower meeting. Your world, right after this.